my daughter helped me pick out these new glasses. Um, I can see most mostly pretty good um, when things get a little further away. Um, I have just a little bit of trouble. Um, things get just a little bit blurry. The eye doctor said that I could go without glasses or wear glasses, but when I put the glasses on, I can see just a little bit more clearly. My, uh, I think these glasses fit my face pretty well, and my daughter says it makes me look like a Harry Potter character, so I kind of like it. In Daniel chapter 7, which we're going to look at today, we get this dream that Daniel has that he cannot interpret, that he needs some help interpreting. But as the interpretation happens, we begin to see a little bit more clearly God's design for us and how we can re-enter his design for us and leave this broken world. I'm going to open up and read Daniel chapter 7, and I hope that as we read this, the scripture, that our eyes are equally opened to being able to see what God has in store for us. Would you mind if I prayed for you and for me so that we could have our eyes spiritually opened to see this scripture? Lord, we ask just now that as we read the scripture, your word to us uh, that describes you and tells us about your plan, that you would spiritually open our eyes to be able to see clearly, that you would open our ears to be able to hear, that you would open and soften our heart so that we can have change happen even with us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Daniel chapter 7, as we get ready to open it, is a change in how uh, the book of Daniel is going. For the first six chapters of Daniel, we, we saw this historical drama played out where God's people were called to remain faithful even in the midst of oppression. They were called to remain faithful and they were called to remain in hope hope that God would rescue them. And so the historical drama now switches to a different type of literature. It's called apocalyptic literature. And apocalyptic literature is now um, dream-based metaphors or vision-based metaphors uh, that are highly symbolic. And so because we are moving from historical drama literature to apocalyptic literature, we need to read it a little bit differently. We need to look for things um, that we might not see otherwise. Now, the meaning from chapter 7 is clear. Whether we study the ancient histories and the ancient cultures, and even if we study, don't even study apocalyptic literature, we can understand the meaning of chapter 7. But if our desire is to grow closer to God and see Him more clearly, we want to understand the Scripture to the best of our abilities. That's what I hope we can do today in Daniel chapter 7. Here is what Daniel chapter 7 says. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, remember Belshazzar was from Daniel chapter um, 5, and he was the king, or yeah, he was the king who would not repent, and God brought judgment on him. This was the king that Daniel had a dream. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, In my vision at night, I looked. And there before me were four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Now, in, in ancient Babylon, in Daniel's day, by this time, um, the sea had a symbolic meaning when it, when it had visions, when they had dreams. Uh, the sea represented forces of evil and chaos that work to destroy good order. And um, the, the sea especially as it was churning, waves going in every direction. Um, this was a horror picture or a horror movie for the people of Israel during this time. Um, I love how Genesis chapter 1, where it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. I love how Genesis chapter 1 sets up this theme that the waters of chaos, the chaos that needed order brought to it, God hovers over those waters and then he brings order to chaos. In the creation story, God was bringing order to chaos. So he uh, separated uh, the day and night. He brought order to that darkness. Then he separated the waters. He brought order to uh, the sky and the water. He brought order to the chaotic waters. And then he separated uh, the land. You know, he was bringing order to each of these realms. Darkness now has order. The water now has order. Land has, now has order. And then he put 
He put the creatures to rule over these different areas of order. Uh, the sun and moon would rule over the day and night. The fish and birds would rule over the water of the sky and the water of the sea. And then the animals would be on the land and the humans would rule over all creation. I love how God brings order to chaos. And so when Daniel has this dream of this chaotic water, there is destruction and chaos that is dangerously close. In verse 3, four Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. So now we have this horror scene perfectly set where the chaos and destruction is getting closer, but all of a sudden out of the waters rise these beasts. Now these beasts are perversions. Um, They're supposed to call to the mind the reader of horror and and be repulsed by them because they're so hideous. The first was like a lion, and it had wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human was given to it. Verse 5, And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Get up and eat your fill of flesh. And after that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings like those of a bird, and the beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Now, this dream is is weird. I don't know what you dreamed last night, but it probably wasn't as weird as this dream. Um, We know from apocalyptic literature, we know from reading the Old Testament that horn, that that horns oftentimes symbolize kings or power, and um, beasts would represent. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna find out what they represent in just a second. Can you hang on and wait for the interpretation? Because the scripture actually tells us what the interpretation is, and then we get to look a little further and read how it connects uh, with the scripture all through. It connects with the Old Testament and the New Testament that we find an even an even better understanding of what this passage and the, what this dream means. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him, and thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. So we have this two uh, visions in this dream, one of this chaos and destruction and and death and these horrible beasts. And then these beasts sprout horns and the horns are representing kings and, and one king is even more boastful than all the others. And then we have order in a courtroom and God sits on his throne and he opens his books and he gets ready to judge. You know, the Ancient of Days here in this poem In Daniel chapter 7, the Ancient of Days is talking about God. And he is eternal, not old. Ancient of Days means he is before time and he'll be here after time ends. His clothing and hair were white for purity and wisdom. And flaming fire and a river of fire comes from his throne. This this is a symbol for sure and certain judgment. And then thousands upon thousands serve him and Tens of thousands are before him, and he opens up his book. Everything will be laid bare, and he is going to bring true and proper judgment. Verse 11, then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but we're allowed to live for a period of time. When God sits in his throne with judgment and he opens the books, 
especially at the end of time. Judgment will be instant. It is sure and certain. And where we think this beast and this this uh, super beast that was worse than all the others and this king rose out of this empire who was more boastful than any of the others, it's instantly over for him. Soon as God says. In my vision, at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with clouds, with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Verse 15, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of this. So Daniel is still dreaming, but he can't interpret the dream. But there is a like an angel standing there that in his vision, he gets to go and ask, what is going on in this vision? Now, I, I'm going to give you a heads up. The, the four beasts represent kingdoms, uh, empires on this earth, a sequence of empires that come, one worse than the next, but not necessarily identified with any one particular kingdom. We, we know maybe one, but the others are harder to identify and harder to relate to. And then the horns represent kings. And then there's going to be one horn that's going to be a worse king than any other others that spring out of these beastly, destructive empires. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Well, the Son of Man mentioned here in verse 13, that's a symbol too. And the interpretation is the holy people of the Most High is the Son of Man. That's kind of neat that the holy people of God that uh, were being trampled on by the beasts would be the ones that would be exalted and would receive the kingdom. Did you, did you see some of that vision as it was played out? Didn't we just get finished reading about in Daniel chapters 1 through 6, God's holy people being trampled by a beastly kingdom? You know, uh, in chapter 1 of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon is this empire with this king. It, it's like a beast, and it goes in, and it, it invades and defeats and destroys Israel. It takes them captive out of Israel into exile, and they're in constant danger when they live in Babylon. In chapter 2, there's a, there's a vision, very much like chapter 7, of this statue with four different types of metals that represent four different types of kingdoms that are going to come in sequential order, um, and they're going to be worse than the last, and Babylon was the first one mentioned. It's even told to Nebuchadnezzar, he is the head of gold, the first metal, kind of like the first beast. In chapter 3, uh, they are in danger, again, because the beastly kingdom and the boastful king who exalts himself above God says, Worship my golden statue or, or I will kill you. And the people of God are trampled. They're trampled under the feet and the destruction of this beast. They're thrown into a fiery furnace. And then in chapter 4, uh, I love this fact. King Nebuchadnezzar was taken up and set on his feet and his, his wings were ripped off. He was humbled, but he was given the heart to be able to understand and worship God. This is the description of the beast out of chapter 7. But there's going to be worse beasts that come after. There's going to be a sequence of empires and kings, one more boastful than the next that follow after, and they are going to constantly, constantly attack God's people and trample them. But just like when the beast was judged, just like when that horn was judged instantly, that we're going to have victory and the holy people, the Most High, will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Verse 19, Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying. With its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell and the horn looked more imposing than the others that, and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, the horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them 
until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. we got to remember, in apocalyptic literature, the, the beasts, the horns, the numbers, the colors, they're all symbolic. So it's not one, two, three, four, five, six, we can count ten kings. It is ten kings representing a number of kings that are going to come. It's not a it's not a complete number. It's not a holy number. It's just a number of kings are going to come. And there's going to be some kings in the sequential order of events. There's going to be some leaders that are going to be so awful. They're going to boast and they're going to exalt themselves above God. And they're going to follow their impulses and instincts and, and selfish self-preservation. Uh, that's what they're going to make as their God themselves. And they're going to be beastly. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. And then um, after them, another king will arise, different from the early ones, and he will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. And the holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. Not a complete time, but but an incomplete time, uh, a short period of time. That you can... I, I love this, how he says... You know, number seven is a number of completeness. This is three and a half. So it's a short period of time. It's not the full time. And that short period of time tells us that we can maintain faithfulness while destruction comes. And we can maintain hope because it's going to be a short period of time that the people of God have to suffer. Verse 26, but the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. You know, in this story, what, what in this vision, we see the kingdom of God, the, the Son of Man, the holy people, having victory. We see them having victory because God sits in judgment and he destroys the beasts, the super beast. He destroys the king, the horn that is boastful almost instantly. And he exalts his people and lifts them up and gives them a kingdom that lives forever. And so we have to ask, why was Daniel deeply troubled by this? He sees victory for his people. Why did his face turn pale in fear even after he saw that his people were going to get victory, and I think this is the reason. And this is why this is important for us to, to know this story. Daniel saw that there's going to be a great victory for God's people, but he also saw that it's going to get worse before it gets better. You know, imagine, Daniel, you, you're living in exile, and you've been living in exile for maybe maybe 50 or 60 years, and you're wondering, when is it going to end? When is the evil empire that rules over his land, that is attacking and keeping his people in constant danger, that is kind of forcing them to compromise their faith, that they have to maintain faithfulness in the, in the, the crushing impact of the culture around them. They have to maintain hope, even though they're thrown in the fiery furnace and they're thrown in the lion's den. He, he's wondering, when is the empire, the evil empire going to end? And I think his face turned pale because God says, well, there's going to be another evil empire that comes after this one and another evil empire that comes after this one. And there's going to be a sequence of events. This is how history is going to work, that every time sinful people gather together and they don't humble themselves and turn to God, they're going to form empires that are evil, that act like beasts. And they're going to be against God's people every time that happens. Anytime they don't humble themselves and turn to the Lord. And so whereas Daniel is, he experienced invasion and defeat and destruction and exile and then constant danger. He's not home yet. And it's going to get worse for God's people. And yet, the victory, the victory is going to supersede all the destruction and death and danger. 
if God's people can just remain faithful. Well, I think this vision is, is for us too. I think that if we experience persecution and we experience the culture being mad at God's people and being mad at us and calling us names and calling us bigots and uh, trying to marginalize us, you know, as Christianity becomes more and more a minority in our nation, uh, we're going to experience more and more persecution. We're going to experience some of the destruction, destructive power of these beastly empires. You know, when God created on the sixth day and he made animals and then he made humans to rule over the animals. Well, animals, uh, we're, humans are kind of like animals where we have impulses and instincts and this selfish desire for self-preservation. But what makes humans beautiful and different is that they were made in the image of God. And we, are, we have been given the power to overcome our impulses and our selfish desires and actually live for other people. This is God's design that we would protect and rule over in such a way that we benefit others and not just be selfish like animals. But as we succumb more and more to our selfish desires, we create this broken reality where people are hurt and they're crushed and the more we give in to our selfish desires and selfish impulses and selfish self-preservation, the more broken we make the world and the more broken we make ourselves. And we need to be rescued from this brokenness. We need to be rescued from this evil, broken kingdom that we have helped create. And, and that's where the Ancient of Days has the Son of Man come into play. This is not only a story that we're going to have to live through, but it's also a story that has already happened. The Son of Man, we are told, symbolizes God's people. But even further than that, there's a symbol behind the symbol. The Son of Man is also Jesus Christ. Now imagine, imagine Jesus, the Son of Man. He takes on humanity and he comes into a broken world and he gets trampled by the empire. But the trampling of the evil empire and even the Son of Man's death is what defeats the evil beast and restores God's people. When Jesus Christ came to earth and died on the cross, he took our brokenness and sin into him, and his death destroyed that sinful, selfish impulses and desires put them to death. And then when God raised him from the dead, it was the victory that overcame all the other evil empires. It even overcame Satan himself. It even overcame death and destruction. This Jesus is what gives us victory to overcome even the brokenness within us. This is good news, but it doesn't mean the battle is over. Daniel's vision shows us we haven't come home yet. We're still going to have to endure. We're still going to have to maintain faithfulness. But we have hope that Jesus conquers all the beasts. Here's what we got to do about this. We have to tell people that Jesus is going to be victorious. We have to tell people that there is a way out of this broken kingdom. We have to tell people that even if an empire raises up that is more ghastly and vicious and uh and destructive than the one before. And even if there is a horn, a king that comes out of that empire, a evil person that is more boastful and destructive than all the ones before, we have to tell people there is a way out of destruction. I, I, have, a, I have a way that maybe you can do that. It's uh, the three circle picture. Uh, I'm going to draw it here and we're going to put it on the screen for you, but there's three circles. And here's how you, can, how you can start a conversation to tell people this story. You can ask them, you can ask them, do you feel like the world is, is, is pretty good or do you feel like the world is broken? Because what I see is a lot of brokenness. And then we draw a circle and we put in the circle brokenness. This is what we see. This is what we see with our clear vision. We see death and destruction. We see people acting selfishly. We see murders. We see bullying going on in schools. We see people being oppressed. Um, and Christians, we can even feel this as we become a minority in our nation. We can even start to feel this brokenness even more. And now, 
when you ask the person, do you, do you feel like the world is broken? I bet they say, yeah, you know, there's some good things. Yeah, there's some good things, but aren't, aren't some things brokenness broken? And have you ever acted in a broken way, acting selfishly when we should have been uh, helping other people? Have you ever acted that way? Yeah, I, I have. And then you say, well, you know, a lot of people don't know it, but God actually designed a world and a people to not be broken. His design is one of peace and love. And we draw another circle. And we put that circle where we show that God's design was that we would have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But when we left God's design and we allowed our selfish impulses to rule over us, that's called sin, and that made us enter into the broken world. That made us broken, and we helped create a broken world. And now that we're here, broken and in a broken world, we'll try anything to get out of our brokenness. We will try, and you can draw these little lines coming off from this brokenness, we will try to be successful, and maybe that will heal our brokenness. But you know what happens when you're broken and you get more success? You have more success, but you're still broken. Or we'll try uh, drugs or alcohol or sex, hoping that that little bit of satisfaction and peace will heal our brokenness. But you know what happens when you use drugs to self-medicate your brokenness? You become addicted to drugs and you're still broken. Or we'll try uh, to lean on other people and depend on other people to help heal our brokenness. But you know what happens when you go and you lean on somebody that's broken and you're broken? Well, you've just brought two broken people together and you're still broken. Now, every time we try one of these rescue efforts or this self-medication, we might get, for just a brief moment, a feeling, or just a brief moment, a a sense of healing, but we're still broken. We didn't have complete healing. God knows that we can't escape this brokenness without him sending some help. And so this is the third circle. God sends Jesus, his perfect son, to come down and enter into our brokenness. And Jesus, when he was perfect and never, never, was himself broken, he allowed the brokenness of the world to kill him on the cross. That's what it means when it says Jesus went to the cross taking our sins and died on the cross. Then Jesus rose from the dead to prove that he could heal all brokenness. And the way for us to escape this broken world and return to God's design, the way for us to have healing for our heart, to escape the brokenness that is within ourself, is to turn from our broken world, that's called repentance in the scripture, and believe that, that Jesus Christ heals our brokenness. We believe on Jesus. We turn and believe, or we believe and we turn. This is how we escape the broken world. This is how we escape our own brokenness. And this is how we return through Jesus Christ to God's design. Where we don't act like beasts. Where we don't help create a beastly empire because of our brokenness. When we believe on Jesus and we turn from this world and we trust and trust ourselves to him, we can escape the broken world and our own brokenness. We gotta tell people this. Otherwise, we're gonna to continue to create these ghastly, horrible, repulsive empires of brokenness. These beastly empires. We have to turn from this and we have to tell people that Jesus was the Son of Man who allowed himself to be trampled by these evil empires, killed on the cross. He became like us so that we could become like him. He allowed himself to be trampled. The people of God, just like the people of God were trampled, but through his death, we now have victory. We gotta tell people like this. Otherwise, they're never gonna be able to escape their brokenness or this broken world. And I gotta tell you, when the Ancient of Days sits on his throne and he opens his books for judgment, all the people on earth are gonna bend their knee and bow to him 
out of respect. And those who have escaped this broken world by trusting in Jesus will be welcomed into God's kingdom. And those who never did accept Jesus, they're going to be cast aside and destroyed with the beasts. There's one more thing we have to draw with this circle. After we've entered back into God's design, we're supposed to grow in that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control of Jesus, the Jesus way, the Jesus power. We're supposed to grow there, and we're also supposed to go. We have to go back into the broken world to tell other people that there is an escape, that God has given them an escape plan. Now, this might make you terrified. This might make even your face pale, because there is a way to escape, and it's through Jesus but then we have to go back into the battle so we can rescue others. This past week, well, I'll tell that story in just a second. You know, Jesus gave us another type of symbolic story so that we can remember that we have left this broken world even though we still remain in it, and we have been healed of our brokenness even though we still battle against sin, ultimately because of his sacrifice. Would you get out your bread and your cup that reminds us that Jesus has the victory. Take out the bread. See, the bread, as we start chewing it, reminds us that Jesus allowed himself to be trampled by this evil kingdom and even our sin. And it's through this trampling that he takes into himself that we're going to have victory. His death gives us hope. It gives us life. Would you participate in the bread? And take out the cup. As Jesus died on the cross, his blood was shed. And he says, the blood of the new covenant poured out for us. When we participate in the cup, we're participating in his blood. We're reminded that his blood covers over our sin and we are made whole. Our brokenness is healed. Would you participate in the cup? Oh, I'm so thankful for this reminder. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us the reminder of your brokenness that actually heals us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just this past week, I had this opportunity to share some of the healing that Jesus can offer to to someone that doesn't even know they're broken. I I went to a restaurant in town, and I was sitting there with a friend, uh, with Dustin, who's getting ready to come to come and join our church and make his membership uh, known here. And this little girl came and took our our drink order as we were having lunch. I mean, when I say little, I said, what grade are you going into? And she said, I'm going to first grade. And her name was Marley. And I said, Marley, uh, I'm going to pray for our lunch. Can I pray for you? And she said, yeah, you can pray for me. I would love to see a rainbow. And you know what? We prayed right there for Marley. We prayed that she would see a rainbow. And I don't know if God gave her a rainbow that day or not, but I told her, Marley, since we prayed that you would have a rainbow, when you see a rainbow, you'll know that God gave you that rainbow. See, we're all looking for that beautiful rainbow of hope. We're all looking for the picture from God that's going to show us that this world, even though it's broken, God is going to bring about healing. We're all looking to escape our brokenness in this broken world. We all want that little piece, that little piece of hope. So I don't know if Marley got to see that rainbow or not, but before I left, uh, she was working with her mom. She had come to come to work with Mom Day. And uh, she took our drink order and we prayed for her. And then her mom came by and introduced herself. Uh, Dustin and I got to invite her and her daughter to come to church. We said, you know, our children's program is great. We were trying to give them the idea that There is healing from brokenness that you can come and enter into. Before I left, that little girl slipped me a note. I still have it. From Marley. And I open it up. And it says, thank you. Thank you for praying for my rainbow. She drew me a rainbow. See, just a moment of discussion, just a moment of prayer can help people be taken out of this broken world and restored to God's design. Now, ultimately, we have to do that through Jesus Christ, but we, we get to be the ones who bring that hope to others. This whole sermon series has been about, are you going to be all in? 
Well, are you going to be all in for helping people to get out of this broken animal empire that's destructive and repulsive and horrific? Are you going to help them get out by telling people about Jesus? Are you going to be all in? Fill out a connection card online right now and we'll help you find out ways to tell others about Jesus. We're going to start a class after Labor Day. We're going to do an online class and an in-person class. We're going to have a small groups that meet where we're going to learn how to help lead people out of this broken world, out of brokenness to a life in Jesus. We're going to teach you how to pray. We're going to teach you how to read the Bible. And we're going to teach you how to share Jesus. We want you to be all in. Fill out a connection card right now so that we can have your name and give you the times for when this class starts after Labor Day so that you can be all in as well. Make the decision today that you're going to be all in. You're going to help people leave this broken world, these animal kingdoms, and enter into God's, re-enter into God's design for healing. Fill out a connection card now and we'll talk to you soon.